All right, welcome everyone to a new episode of the Roscoe's Wetsuit Podcast. I am your host, Toby Passman. On my show today, I have a very special guest, Dr. Frank Schallenberger. Um, Dr. Schallenberger is a six-time grandfather and four-time father. He's one of the originals. He's been practicing medicine since 1973 and has been a pioneer in alternative and integrative medicine since 1978. Dr. Schallenberger has revolutionized the practice of anti-aging and preventative medicine by developing a method to measure mitochondrial function and oxygen utilization. He's written two popular books describing this method, The Type 2 Diabetes Breakthrough and Bursting with Oxygen, along with numering, uh, authoring numerous papers in the international peer-reviewed literature on ozone therapy and oxygen utilization. Dr. Schallenberger, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Uh, glad to be here, Toby. Awesome. Well, I want to first start off just by talking a little about mitochondrial function. It's something that I think has gained a lot of, you know, popular press and, you know, a lot of just mm -hmm. lay people talking about it um, over the past few years. Can you briefly kind of describe, you know, the mitochondria, why they're important and why, you know, people should be paying attention to, to the health of their mitochondria? The, you know, the mitochondria are probably at the very bottom of uh, why we stay healthy or why we get sick. It's the, probably the single most important determining factor there. And the reason is because on the one hand, uh, the thing that keeps us alive is energy. And that's where the energy comes from. So, uh, you know, nothing else is gonna happen if you don't have energy, right? So th uh, that's, uh, that's where all the energy comes from, the mitochondria. So that's, that's one thing that makes them extremely important. The other is they go bad as we get older. They don't get better. They start, they start to decline in their level of efficiency. Uh, and just for, just for the listeners, to give you, if you don't know what mitochondria are, let me just give you a, a thumbnail sketch. Inside each and every one of your cells, Red cells, by the way, would be an exception to this rule uh, because they actually carry oxygen, but every other cell in the body, uh, in each of every cell in the body, energy is uh, uh, created in that cell through oxygen as it gets processed in the mitochondria. So all that oxygen that we breathe in, it only has one purpose, one destination, that's to go into one of our cells and in the cell, the oxygen gets processed in the mitochondria, energy gets released, the cells use that energy to do what they do. There's a lot of incredibly important functions that the cells have to do, but every single one of those functions requires energy, and that's where the energy comes from. So if, you're mito if you have lots of mitochondria, and cells, uh, you know, a healthy cell will have in the order three to 4,000 mitochondria in it. In each cell, if you so, if you have your a big quota of mitochondria, and if the mitochondria are functioning well, you're going to get a lot of energy in that cell, and it's going to do its thing at optimal levels. Conversely, to the extent that the mitochondria don't work as well, or you don't have as many, both of which happen with aging. Uh, to that extent, you, cells are going to have less energy, they're going to be less likely to be able to work at optimum levels, and the bottom line is, things are going to start breaking down a lot sooner. Interesting. And at this point in the conversation, I feel like people are probably, you know, wondering, okay, well, you know, what is the health of my mitochondria? Um, and it sounds like, you know, from what I've read, you've kind of pioneered this new method of, of testing mitochondrial function. Uh, using respiratory gas analyses. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. Can you tell me a little about how that works? Okay. How are you able to test the people's mitochondrial function? You know, about uh, 25 years ago, you know, realizing how important mitochondria were, I started thinking to myself, the, these mitochondrial function is the most critical thing that happens to us as we get older. And uh, so... The problem is there's no way to measure it. You don't know. And it's, it's sort of like your blood pressure. If you don't measure your blood pressure, you don't know what it is. 
if you don't measure your temperature, you don't know what it is. And uh, so I thought, here we are, the most important single thing that ever happens to us as we get older is, is problems with mitochondrial function, and yet we have absolutely no way to assess it. So I started thinking uh, about that, and, what, uh, and, the, and the logic really is quite simple. All the oxygen that we breathe in, it only has one destination, one purpose, and that's to go into the mitochondria and be processed into energy. So if I can just find a way to monitor what happens to the oxygen that we breathe in, I have a direct way of assessing what's going on with the mitochondria. So it's very simple. There are devices uh, that you can buy. They've been around a long time, just haven't been used for this purpose, but been around a long time. Uh, and what these devices do is you breathe through a tube. Typically, you have a, like a face mask on, like a, a scuba mask or something. And as you're breathing through this mask, it's connected with a tube down into a device that's going to measure essentially two things. One is how much oxygen is your body is consuming. And two is when, it, when, you, when, when the mitochondria process oxygen for energy, they release carbon dioxide. And the more efficient the mitochondria are operating, the less carbon dioxide they release. So, we're, so this device will measure how much oxygen my body is consuming and simultaneously how much carbon dioxide it's producing. And I can look at those two numbers. I can look at the absolute values of those numbers. And I can look at the ratio of those numbers. And we do this with the person resting quietly for 10 minutes. We put them on a bicycle and we work them harder and harder and harder uh, uh, for approximately, say, 20 minutes, something like that. And we take all that data. And from that data, we can, putting that data into various formulas, we can determine with exact precision exactly what the mitochondria are doing. How, uh, are they producing, a, are they uh, processing a lot of oxygen? or just a little bit of, I can tell you exactly how much oxygen they're processing and with exact levels of efficiency, exactly how efficiently they're doing that. So I'm curious with all of this data now and the testing, what are say the biggest things that you've found? Um, I guess we can come at this from both angles. What are the biggest things that you've found with this testing that improve mitochondrial function or um, take away from mitochondrial function? besides aging, which we already mentioned. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's like the holy grail, you know, trying to find out how can, how can I optimize my mitochondrial function? Because ultimately, we want to get to be really, really old people with really, really youthful mitochondrial function. That's the goal. That's the, that's the end zone. Being really old, but the mitochondria are functioning like they're, they're new and young. Uh, that is so possible. Uh, for example, what's fresh on my mind is a guy I saw maybe four weeks ago, 86 year old man. I've been working with him now for almost 12 years, 86 year old guy. And he has the mitochondrial function of a 32 year old, hmm. exactly the same as a 32, your average 32 year old. And uh, now how is that possible? He's basically functioning, even though he's 86 years old, he's basically as functional as the average 32-year-old. He's got wrinkles and he's got all that other stuff that happens to you over time. But in terms of functionality, ability to do what he wants, the way the brain works, the way he detoxifies, all those things, he's like a 32-year-old. So it's very possible. So you, having done this for some 20 plus years, I mean, that's the first thing I wanted to know. What do I need to do to improve mitochondrial function? And so what we would do is we would do lots of tests. So we would get people, measure their mitochondrial function, and find out it wasn't very good. And we would give them a, a supplement or we would give them a hormone or we would put them on a diet or we, you know, have some kind of intervention with them and then come back and recheck the mitochondrial function and see if we got a bump. And so we've been looking at that for, for a long time. And uh, now the book I wrote, uh, which is um, called Bursting with Energy, kind of explains this a little bit. 
On the other hand, that book was written maybe 10 years ago, so it's not quite up to par. Uh, so what I can tell you is a couple of things that are just obviously critical. And that is one that totally stands out, probably the number one thing you and I can do to get our mitochondria operating at a very high level is high intensity interval training. Very interesting. And yeah, so that's number one. It's every now and then, I, and in fact, yesterday I saw somebody like this who had really good numbers. I think the guy was 64-ish or something. He had very good mitochondrial numbers and he didn't exercise. So you will find people like this. Uh, and, 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 you know, the thing is, I, and I like, to tell, I like to explain this to people, we're all different. And we all, all have different genetics, right? So some of us come into this world with incredibly good mitochondrial genetics, which, by the way, you get from your mother. Some of us come into the world not so good. <laughs> you know, so now this man that I'm talking about, he happened to be a very good athlete as a young man. And so that automatically clues you in. He probably was born with really good genetics. Right. Uh, and from the mitochondrial standpoint. So that's probably how he got to the point of being 64 years old, not exercising, uh, and, and yet has pretty good mitochondrial uh, function. On the other hand, you're going to have somebody else who was not born with genetics like that. And their mitochondrial function is going to be A1 dependent on high intensity interval training. So that's, that'll be number one that we look at. The other thing is surprising to me and might be surprising to a lot of the listeners, but this totally, this caught me off guard. I didn't realize I was going to see this, but when, if I take your mitochondrial function and, uh, and I measure it and it's looking really good and I turn around and I give you some carbohydrates to eat. Now, normally when we test this, we test it in a fasting modality just mm -hmm. to control for food. But I, uh, let's say I give you some carbohydrates to eat. Could be an apple, could be a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, whatever, doesn't much matter. Bring you back in an hour and retest your mitochondrial function. 85% of the time, it'll be significantly depressed. Because for the majority of people, there's about 15% of the population that is not like this. But for about 85% of the American population, carbohydrates absolutely suppress mitochondrial function wow so it's crazy huh it is and, crazy you know, these, these, these days we hear a lot about this but back 20 years ago you know we didn't really people were still pushing how great wonderful carbohydrates are right well it's interesting to think about i mean how you know oftentimes you think of like carbohydrates as an energy source you know as a fuel source yet yeah when we're testing the mitochondria, it's actually showing, you know, their slower energy production after consuming that, which is very surprising. Yes, it, it's really surprising. Now, the truth is that uh, people are different. So in your mitochondria, the way they produce energy from oxygen is the oxygen interacts in the mitochondria with either fat or from, with glucose, which is basically carbohydrate broken down, right? So, so in, in your mitochondria, the oxygen you're breathing in is going to either metabolize fat or it's going to metabolize glucose or sugar. The thing is, with some people, their mitochondria way prefer to burn fat over glucose. And for other people, their mitochondria prefer way to burn glucose over fat. So there's totally different, a whole spectrum of uh, metabolisms out there. And the only way you're going to find out which kind of metabolism you have is to get, use this test and get tested by it. Because there are going to be some people, and like I said, it's approximately 15% of the population. When I do the test, I'm going to look at them, I'm going to say, you have the kind of metabolism that wants to eat a lot of carbohydrate you will thrive with carbohydrate. In fact, if you don't get enough carbohydrate, you're going to be tired and run down. Wow. So, I mean, this... I might tell somebody else, listen, you better stay away from carbohydrates. It's essentially poison for you. Right. 
Yeah, no, I mean, this, this seems like it could have huge implications as far as, you know, when people, you know, with all the kind of popular diets right now, there's like people just very kind of, um, you know, in, in each camp yeah. who are very strong advocates of, you know, keto or paleo right. or, or vegan. And it's like, you know, now what we're coming to find out with genetics and, you know, something like this test, it seems like could be really helpful as far as, you know, showing someone, okay, this is the correct diet what you're going to thrive on the most. Our culture is uh, so used to statistical medicine and statistical science. That's, that's the way I was trained in medical school in the 1960s. That's what everybody's used to. You know, if you do something and uh, greater than 50% of the people do really well on that, there's this tendency to make everybody do that which is, is bogus. Well, what we need to do is this concept that they, they call now personalized medicine. We try to figure out, well, what's right for this guy? May not be right for that guy, but what's right for this guy? What's the right diet for him? Is there a hormone that he needs? Is there a vitamin that he needs? And, and so it becomes pretty aggravating, uh, if you're me anyhow, and you see people writing books like, everybody ought to eat this way or everybody ought to exercise this way, or everybody ought to get eight hours of sleep, or everybody can't, no, you can't get four hours of sleep. You know, it's, it's so different and it's so varying that you really have to test people to try to figure out, you know, what's right for them. And my point is, if I test you and your mitochondrial function looks great, like that 86-year-old guy I was talking about, well, I'm not gonna tell him to do anything. I'm just basically going to say, look, whatever you're doing, just keep on doing it. That's working. It's really working well. And, and so he can leave the office knowing, hey, what I do is right. I don't have to change anything. I don't have to switch up. I'm, I'm right on the money for my particular genetics. Conversely, if I have somebody come in and they test out lousy, you know, now we got to say, okay, whatever you're doing, not working so well. So let's, let's try this, and then we bring you back and we retest you. And either you test out better or you don't test out better. If you don't test out better, it's, it's on the plan B. And we keep working that out until we find what, is the, what, is the, what, what are the special remedies for you, given your genetics, that make your mitochondria work better. Right. I mean, that, that approach makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I'm curious as far as, you know, if we could talk specifically about, uh, mitochondria in the brain, um, okay. cause I know a lot of, you know, different psychiatric neurological conditions, um, even neurodegenerative diseases have been linked to mitochondrial dysfunction. So how, you know, what's the importance of, of mitochondria there? Every, every organ in the body requires energy, but some organs more or less obviously require more energy than other organs because they're very, they're a lot busier. Uh, one of those is the kidney. The kidney is constantly working and filtering out things. Another one's the liver, but the, the one, the heart, obviously, but the one organ that certainly uh, requires the most single amount of energy would be the brain. And uh, so if, if you have mitochondrial issues, probably one of the first places you're going to start noticing that is going to be in your brain. And, and so what, what, you know, whatever, say, tendency you might have in your brain, let's say you're a person that's, that tends to have insomnia, or let's say you're a person that tends to get depressed, or whatever your deal is, uh, as your brain gets deprived uh, of adequate amounts of energy, it's going to it's going to fall down into certain state of symptoms that you can see. But it's very clear. I was just even looking at an article that was published uh, maybe three, four months ago. And they were looking at Alzheimer's in particular, for example. And um, there's these plaques that form in the brain of Alzheimer's that come from these things called amyloid proteins. Turns out that what these researchers were able to show is that the, the, our brains make these amyloid proteins when the mitochondria aren't functioning well. Mm. So as you and I get older and we start experiencing uh, the, the decrease in mitochondrial function, 
which can start around the age of 35. And, but, but by the time you get to be 60, 65, it could be fairly decreased. Your mitochondrial function could have dropped down very significantly. As that's happening, you're putting more and more of these amyloid beta plaques into your brain. And depending on your genetics and susceptibility and such, you may be that guy that gets Alzheimer's. Whereas if you didn't let your mitochondria go down, you could have probably avoided Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting about Alzheimer's. Um, and it seems like, I mean, the, the approach to treating that uh, or, you know, different psychiatric conditions seems to be very, a very like top down approach, you know, as far as targeting, you know, one or two neurotransmitters and trying to, you know, either elevate or decrease the levels mm -hmm. of those. Whereas, you know, if you get, you know, the mitochondria working properly, it seems like, you know, uh, just the whole body and brain is going to be, you know, given the, the sufficient energy it needs to, to run properly. Is that kind of an accurate sort of how you view it? Absolutely. You know, and, you know, I think listeners can probably appreciate this a little bit uh, because they could probably just think of their own experience and ask themselves, uh, when was the last time I knew or heard of somebody who was in really great cardiovascular condition, i.e. good mitochondria, okay? really good cardiovascular condition, who had anything go wrong with them. It happens, but it's rare enough so that when it does happen, it probably makes the newspaper. So we hear of these cases, but they're not at all uncommon. The, the one that's common is the guy has the heart attack or the guy gets the Alzheimer's or the dementia or he gets the cancer. And, you know, people who know him are thinking to himself, well, yeah, he was in really bad shape and he didn't take good care of himself and so on. And these were factors that led to that happening. Right. Right. So then as far as, you know, uh, it seems like you have kind of also pioneered some of the therapies to, to treat mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, can you tell me a little as far as ozone therapy may be something that a lot of listeners, you know, may have heard of, may not have heard of. It mm -hmm. seems relatively uh, uh, still kind of working its way into, you know, at least Western medicine. But can you tell me a little as far as ozone goes? Sure. For, for the listeners that, that, that haven't, um, aren't aware of this, uh, ozone is a very high potency molecule made out of oxygen. And, um, and it's been used throughout the world for decades. It's new to the United States. I actually brought this therapy to the United States about seven, eight, nine years ago when I formed the American Academy of Ozone Therapy. Um, and now we have in excess of a thousand doctors here in the U.S. that are utilizing ozone as a medical therapy. But it's just new here. It's not new around the rest of the world. Around the rest of the world, it's actually been there since the 1800s, if you want to know the truth. Uh, but people should know that when we talk about ozone as a, as a medical therapy, we're talking about a high-potency version of oxygen. Normally, oxygen travels in pairs. So every oxygen atom finds another oxygen atom, and uh, they get together, kind of and they form a bond together. And the reason that is has to do with the amount of electrons that each atom has. They don't have enough electrons, but if they get together, they can share electrons. So that's your standard, uh, very stable form of oxygen. We call it O2, because there's two atoms of oxygen in there. That's what we're breathing right now. Uh, O3 is what ozone is. So to, to, to get ozone, you actually have to make it. You can't capture it, you can't buy it in a bottle, anything like that. You gotta make it. So what doctors do is we take oxygen, O2, run it through a little converter box. And what the converter box does is it shoots electricity over the oxygen molecules. That causes them to explode a little bit, to break apart into single atoms. And instantaneously, however, they recombine back into their pairs, but a small percentage of them, something like two, 3%, depending on you know, how you, everything's set up, 
will convert back into O3. So that you'll have three oxygen atoms sharing the amount of electrons that make two oxygen atoms stable. So that three oxygen atom set up, it's not very stable. It's a highly reactive molecule. O2, pretty stable. If I take O2 and say inject it into you, it'll more or less just sit there. It's not going to do much. But I take O3 and inject it into you. Uh, instantaneously, there's an enormous amount of what we call oxidative signaling going on in your entire body, almost instantaneously, almost as if you could kind of co compare it to an electrocution. Let's say you had lightning strike your body. Instantaneously, it pervades every aspect of your physiology. This is what it's like when you inject ozone into the human body, and there's lots of ways to do that. But one of the interesting things is because it's oxygen, it's a very potent stimulator of mitochondrial function. So, so, so what, what, what it's like for me is, and what I've learned is, the reason, I mean, there's lots of reasons people get sick, but the very bottom, the very core reason people get sick is that their mitochondria don't work so well. They don't have the energy that required to stay well. So you could you can clearly make the statement, and this is about as close to being 100% true as anything you could say. There's no possible way in the world that anybody who's sick with anything significant, and by that I mean a cardiovascular disease or a diabetes or cancer or autoimmune disease or whatever, 100% of the time they got bad mitochondria. 100% of the time. And there's no way they stand any chance at all of getting well unless the mitochondria are improved. So it's sort of a baseline foundational therapy that you can use essentially on every sick person there is. Wow. So I'm, I'm curious because from what I've read about ozone, it is what they call like an oxidative therapy, right? Yeah. Where you know, most people, I mean, what, what gets all of the kind of popular press coverage is, you know, antioxidants, you know, the vitamin C and, and glutathione, you know, all of these being uh, antioxidants and people thinking that is, is a good thing. Um, from my understanding, they are, but at the same time, when you, when you trigger this uh, with oxidative therapy, it can actually real, uh, rebuild your body's kind of own production of those antioxidants. Is that kind of what ozone is doing? Well, yeah, you're, you're pretty much right on it there. Uh, so, so in the body, you know, you always got, you, you, the, the body wants to stay in balance. So these bodies were created with a whole series of systems that when one thing comes along and throws us out of balance, we've got another thing that's going to come along and bring us back into balance almost instantaneously. So what we have in the body is we have things that, uh, we have systems in the body, for example, that will make your blood pressure higher. Then we also have other symptoms that are make your blood pressure lower. So that if it's too high, the lower systems start working. If it's too low, the higher systems start working. And I just use that as an example, because this is how yeah, I many thousands, if not millions of times across the board with all kinds of things. And one of, those, one of those two systems kind of setups is the oxidants and the antioxidants, which you were just talking about. So on the one hand, you can't survive without oxidants. All that oxygen that you're breathing in that's keeping you alive is an oxidant. So you can't survive without oxidants. It is incredibly important to have free radicals. It's incredibly important to have oxidants. On the other hand, uh, you have antioxidant systems to contain those oxidants, to make sure they don't get out of, um, out of order, so to speak, and start making damage, because they, they can be destructive molecules. So you have antioxidant systems. And the other point is, without the antioxidant systems, you couldn't live either. So you actually need both to get that balance. So on the one hand, you got the antioxidant systems, that are kind of controlling what the oxidants do. And then you have the oxidant cysts, the oxidants that are actually giving us energy and keeping us alive. So it's about getting that balance right in there. 
Very interesting. So as far as ozone goes, I'm curious, um, I guess, first off, what what are the uh, conditions that it's been found to be kind of more, uh, most effective for? Yeah. Um, well, you know, if I had to like pick one thing that it's all by itself as a standalone therapy, ozone is a, re, absolutely remarkable. I would pick pain. Hmm. Pain is, uh, there's a lot of factors that go into why we have pain, but I'm talking more or less about chronic pain, pain that won't go away, never heals. And um, the, at the very bottom of what causes chronic pain is uh, decreased mitochondrial function. And that's why these areas never get better. So, you know, you can go out and fall down and tear your rotator cuff or something. And, uh, and you, you know, you fully expect that within a matter of one, two, maybe three months, that, that rotator cuff's going to heal and you're going to be back to normal again. But there are going to be a lot of people out there that are going to hurt their rotator cuff or some other part of their body. And then they're going to wake up like nine, ten months, a year later, and they're going to think to themselves, you know what? This isn't getting better. It's supposed to be getting better. But it's absolutely no better now than it was 10 months ago. Maybe it's even worse. So you ask yourself the question, what's the deal? How come it didn't heal? And the answer is always decreased mitochondrial function. So the really cool thing about ozone, probably the single coolest thing about it, is you can take ozone, keeping in mind now this is a gas. It's not a liquid. And it's a gas you make right up there in the office. You could take ozone in a syringe and inject it into an area of pain. Just get a needle, stick the needle in wherever it hurts. Could be a rotator cuff, could be a knee, could be a back, could be a neck, could be a tennis elbow. Doesn't matter. And the pain goes away. Hmm. It's astounding. All by itself, with nothing else. Wow. I mean, I'm not saying you need about physical therapy or anything else. It'll make the darn pain go away. So, so if I had to like pick one thing that was just remarkable about ozone, I would pick on pain and tissue regeneration, healing up bad knees, healing up bad hips, bad necks, bad backs, whatever. But the point is, I want to say that in other areas, say, say like cancer, cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, infectious disease, where, where ozone isn't necessarily a standalone therapy, it will certainly make everything else work tons better. So for example, I, will treat, I treat cancer patients. I actually, in my practice, I know how to give low dose chemotherapy. So we use chemo agents in my practice. Uh, we do detoxification. It's a, it's a collage you know, of all the kind of the conventional medical stuff and more of the alternative medical stuff. Put the whole package together. In, in my practice. Uh, and I can say without a doubt that when you take chemotherapy and combine it with ozone therapy, the combination there is amazing. Hmm. You, you, you get very few of the side effects you conventionally see with chemotherapy. You don't get the immune system suppression you see with chemotherapy. Uh, you, uh, the chemotherapy works lots better. Uh, and you, and you could, and this could branch out to pretty much any specialty, where you know whether you're a cardiologist or a dermatologist or uh, you know you're a macular degeneration. Let's say you're an ophthalmologist. It doesn't matter what your specialty is. Uh, you add ozone therapy into what you're already doing, your results just got twice as good. Right. Well, it makes sense. I mean, at any condition that involves yeah. mitochond mitochondrial dysfunction, ozone's gonna, you know play a part in improving that yeah so. it makes sense it makes sense you know in the common thing of you know by the way if you're sick and you've got a problem shouldn't you be eating really well <laughs> you know are you going to go out and you know eat oreos and mcdonald's all day long i don't think so you need you need you know so it's just common in a way it's common sense right what about as far as, you know, ozone and say, you know, more like the, the peak performance aspects of things mm. is our athletes are, you know, uh, Olympic uh, teams, are they using ozone? Uh, is it something you can test for as far as a performance enhancer or? Well, you can't, you can't really test for it. 
Uh, and uh, I, am, I know that some of the European leagues have a rule against uh, what they call doping with ozone. But the reality is this, uh, these athletes, when, you, when you're up at that level of athleticism, your mitochondria are pretty much top game anyway. And so you're not gonna see much of a bump from ozone therapy. Now you could use it as an athlete, say for pain management, if they sprain something, you can make them heal better. I know a lot of soccer teams, for example, where after all the games or practices, they inject all the painful areas that these guys had uh, with some ozone so they can recover three times faster. Uh, but the actual the doping with ozone, it's not going to give you a benefit because you're already at the top of your game. That's con that stands conversely to uh, you know, your average Joe who is not on that level, he will benefit from it. He'll see, an, he'll see a bump from it. Right. Okay. So that makes sense. Kind of bringing people who have depressed mitochondrial function, kind of bringing that back up to, to optimal. Yeah, but these, these athletes, they're already up here. I mean, you can't right. hard push them any higher. Right. Right. So let's talk now about, uh, as far as another kind of condition that's sort of plaguing, um, you know, the Western world, you know, being type two diabetes, mm. you wrote an entire book on it. And I'm curious as far as, you know, how ozone ties in or, or just mitochondrial function uh, or other stuff um, that we haven't talked about yet. But what, what is kind of the Western uh, medical approach? It, it, they seem to be getting it completely wrong as far as treating <laughs> diabetes, since it's still such a huge issue. So, so what's your take on that? Yeah, uh, they really do get it wrong. They've got some good ideas. There's some good medicines out there and such, but the whole approach is, is, is wrong. Uh, and, uh, and the reason I wrote the book about diabetes is because diabetes is the classic disease example of decreased mitochondrial function. There is no way you're ever going to get diabetes if you have good mitochondrial function. It's not happening. So this epidemic that we're currently seeing, even in kids, as you know, uh, has, it has to do with the fact that there's things out there that are apparently ruining our mitochondria at a much faster rate than they used to get, they used to get damaged. And so the focus always wants to be with diabetes, improve mitochondrial function. Now, if you remember, we were just talking about how oxygen produces energy in the mitochondria by either combining with fat or with sugar. So you see, oh, sugar's right in there. And the problem with diabetics is uh, their mitochondria won't allow them to burn the sugar. And so their sugar levels can build up. They have to burn fat. Diabetics are the classic type of people who in their cells, their cells prefer, prefer burning fat. They, they don't want to burn sugar, and which is okay, because they can't. <laughs> and so they want to burn fat. So a diabetic is the classic person that wants to have a diet very high in fat. Now, some of the listeners may be hearing me thinking, oh, this guy's a nutcase. He's telling me to eat a lot of fat, when in fact, everybody's been telling me for the last 40 years to eat less fat. That's the bad guy. Uh, yes, and I am telling you, eat lots of fat. If you're that person, if you're the person whose cells prefer to burn fat, and you eat glucose or sugar or carbohydrates instead, you're going to get diabetes in all likelihood, if you have the genetics for it, you're getting diabetes. And that's why we have so much diabetes. Because for the past 20, 30, 40 years, everybody's been telling you, all the so-called experts, don't eat fat, it's really, really bad for you. And what you wanna eat is all these carbs because they give you this tremendous amount of energy. So great, so we all go do that, and now we got a diabetes epidemic. Right, right. I mean, it seems like hopefully things are, are starting to shift. I mean, it seems like, I don't know, the past uh, five, seven, ten years yeah. um, since the whole kind of, you know, the way I got into 
you know, it, being interested in all this stuff is sort of from Dave Asprey's work, yeah. you know, with, uh, with Bulletproof and biohacking, you know, with that kind of being a big movement as far as the, the high fat goes. Yeah. But I mean, it seems like with, you know, ketogenic diets are, are nothing new. Um, from my understanding, they were used to, to treat, you know, kids with intractable uh, epilepsy, right back in the, in the 60s or 70s. So well, it goes actually back to the 20s. The 20s. Yeah, 1920s is when that paper was first put out. Wow. So we kn we've known for a while yeah. the benefits of of at least some people eating uh, good amounts of of good of uh, healthy fat. Yeah. Interesting. Do you? Yeah, so, yeah, Asbury is you know probably he's been the guy that's put this on the map. So you have you have guys like me out there that are doing all the research and the clinical work. But it takes somebody like Dave to come along and write the books and get it out there to people so they hear this new information. Because without Dave the, and people like him, all they're doing is getting information from the vested people that are already in the system and want to promote diabetes. Mm -hmm. They don't want to promote the fixing of diabetes. They want to promote everything they've been promoting for the last 40 years high carbohydrate, low fat diets. Well, I mean, it makes sense financially. If, if they don't fix it, then more people are going to continue. It's a little or cynical, drugs. but there's reality there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah so it seems like, you know, a lot of the, the research findings, I mean, it, uh, I had heard somewhere that, you know, what, what we actually see in medicine is kind of 20 years behind mm. like the research like it takes the research that long to kind of get converted into to actual like practical medical applications is that something that you found just as you're you know in your work as a doctor you know it, it's even getting worse it's worse but you're absolutely right you know in, in medicine uh, you know doctors and scientists involved in medicine are and should be a little cynical and should be a little skeptical about things. I got that. That's the way we ought to be. We shouldn't like just grab onto the first thing that pops along and give it to everybody like it's wonderful. We need to be a little skeptical about it and look at it. And so it's true. Somebody will come along with penicillin and it, it'll be 10, 15 years before, you know, people down the end are using penicillin. Well, well that's reasonable. But what, what we have now is not only that kind of an issue going on, but we have an entire system here in the United States uh, between big pharma, big medicine, big insurance. We've, we've got this system that absolutely promotes everything uh, that makes money. Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't matter if it's good for you or bad for you. That's not the bottom line. The bottom line has to do with money. And it's a dang shame. So, I mean, you, it could be like 200 years, if ever, mm -hmm. something like ozone therapy becomes accepted as a major thing. Wow. Simply because of that. How about, I'm curious what your opinion is as far as some of the other kind of, uh, uh, regenerative therapies, say mm. like uh, like se uh, stem cells, what yeah. as far as well, uh, their impact, kind of maybe just on yeah. mitochondrial function, but also just in general, what's your take on those? Okay, so yeah, so in the clinic we use stem cells, we use the platelet-rich plasma, and we use some homeopathics, and we we combine a lot with the ozone now. So initially we started off just injecting ozone. So back in the 70s and 80s, that's all I used to do, for example, is just use ozone by itself, because that was the, the, the major principle. Uh, since then, we've learned that, wow, there's all these other things that you can use with ozone. And ozone's a great catalyst. And so I can tell any doctor, you know, whatever you're doing, you throw ozone into the mix, it's gonna be better, you're gonna do better. And this is true for platelets, it's true for stem cells, it's true for virtually anything that you want to do. Throw the ozone in there and all of a sudden it's tons better. Uh, and so all the regenerating properties of stem cells and platelets, all of those are remarkably enhanced if you put them in combination with ozone, which by the way has its own regenerative properties. 
Right. So there's a synergistic effect there. Yeah. So, you know, let's say I've got a guy with a really bad knee. This happens all the time in the clinic. Got a guy comes in with a bad knee. He's probably limping. Uh, you look at the x-ray. It doesn't look so good. He, you, he says, Doc, I'm here because the last doctor I saw told me I needed, you know, a, a, a brand new knee. They need to cut my knee out and put in an artificial knee. And I don't want to go do that. Uh, that guy... I can inject him uh, in that day, one day. It takes me all of maybe 15 minutes. I can shoot some ozone into his knee along with some vitamins and minerals. I can then shoot some platelets into the knee. I can then shoot some stem cells into the knee. And in four months later, he'll be walking around like there's not a problem. And if you wow. look at the images, you'll see growth of cartilage. You'll see repair of ligaments and repair of tendons. It's pretty darn remarkable. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy to think what, what, I, you know, what else is kind of possible as far as, you know, with, with the sort of alternative or functional medicine, what, are there any other kind of like looking into the future? Um, what are, are any other kind of therapies, do they stand out to you as super promising or uh, just kind of what, where do you see the field going? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, you know, ozone's always going to be there because it's one of those fundamental things. It's like eating right, sleeping right, you know, exercise. They're always going to be part of the program. That's not going to vary. Uh, but ozone is particularly helpful as, as we get older and stuff starts breaking down, like your knee or maybe your brain's not quite as sharp or whatever. It becomes more important uh, as we get older. Uh, in terms of what's up in the future, I'm thinking, um, well, these stem cells have been a game changer. They've just told the, the core derived stem cells been an absolute game changer in my practice. I can fix things I never used to be able to fix before. Uh, so I know that's going to get better and they're going to come out with, uh, you can take these stem cells, by the way, and you can train them. It's illegal here in the U.S. So the FDA won't allow us to train them. But you can. The technology is there. You can take the stem cells and put them through a series of, uh, of treatments that will make them regenerate bone or make them regenerate brain cells or make them regenerate something else, you know, whatever you want to do. And then once they're trained, then you can take the new trained stem cells and probably do some outstanding stuff. I'm thinking of macular degeneration, which even to today is very difficult to treat, uh, certainly in its advanced stages. And I'll bet you a nickel we're going to see uh, them coming up with some stem cells that we can inject into the eye or around the eye or something like that to, to fix that particular problem. Right now, we're putting stems, not stem cells per se, but these things called exosomes, right into cerebral spinal fluid for dementia, for cases of dementia and cases of Parkinson's. And I'm aware of a physician up in New Jersey who has been taking uh, uh, exosomes and injecting them straight into the brainstem. Wow. I can't do that in my clinic because you got to have a whole special setup to be able to do that, you know? Uh, but, but yeah, so wow. So he, here he is. And I've seen him take a guy with Parkinson's who has fairly progressed and turn him around in about five days. With the exosomes. By taking those exosomes and shooting them right in, somehow right up there and around C1 and the, the bottom of, and the brainstem. Interesting. Can you yeah. just briefly introduce kind of what, what exosomes are doing? Yes. So uh, we're, our, our ideas of stem cells are changing a little bit. Uh, you know, we've always had this concept of stem cells as being cells that can differentiate they call them pluripotent stem cells, but can differentiate into other cells. So let's say I have a stroke. Uh, some, some of my brain cells are dead. The concept has been uh, my stem cells are going to go to that area, and they're going to literally turn into brain cells to replace the ones that are dead. It turns out that that's probably not what's going on in an adult. In in Infants, newborn babies, and maybe kids up to the age of six or seven months, that's what happens. We know that happens. Uh, but for us, once you get to be, you know, 
past four, five, six years old, we don't think that's what happens anymore. We think what happens is the fact that stem cells uh, contain thousands of little bubbles called exosomes, E-X-O-S-O-M-E-S. -E and these exosomes contain uh, DNA fragments, they contain uh, proteins, they contain growth factors, they contain cytokines, all kinds of these regenerative sorts of molecules. And what happens is that when, when I get the stroke and the stem cells go to that area of my brain, they release all these exosomes out into the tissues. And then these exosomes with all these growth factors that they have in them cause that area to regenerate and repair. So we have a little, so basically what I'm saying is in adults, our current concept of stem cell therapy is that the stem cells are just sort of the transport vehicle for the exosomes. It's the exosomes that are really doing the healing. Mm -hmm. So why not just take the exosomes? Why actually inject the stem cells per se? Why not just inject the exosomes, which is what you can do now, because you can go out and buy exosomes too. Mm -hmm. Wow, so that could really be huge as far as uh, you mentioned the, the doctor in New Jersey, um, you know, using that to treat neurodegenerative conditions. I wonder as far as, you know, psychiatry, neurology, um, other, you know, possible things that that could be helpful for. That's yeah, you know, we're kind of working on, on that in the sense that we are now uh, taking certain people, self-included, uh, who don't ostensibly have anything wrong with them. And, and injecting a bunch of exosomes into them just to see what it happened. <laughs> wow, that's a fun <laughs> They're experiment. They're entirely safe, so we can do it. Uh, and so we're, and yeah, it, 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 it's going to be interesting to look at that and like to get somebody who's like chronically depressed uh, and inject a whole bunch of exosomes and see if it doesn't go away. It just might. Hmm. Wow. That's, Especially, yeah, by the way, if you pre-treat them with ozone therapy for about three weeks, that's another thing we've discovered. If, if, if I'm going to give the stem cells or the exosomes to anybody for regenerative purposes, if I pre-treat them and get the mitochondria up and running really well, and then put the stem cells or exosomes in there, the results are a lot better. Hmm. Wow. Awesome. Well, this has been uh, a fascinating discussion, Dr. Schellenberger. I've enjoyed talking with you and having you on the show today. Okay. Um, can you tell me a little as far as if, uh, you know, any resources, if listeners are more curious about finding out about your work or, or your books, where would you direct people to? Okay. Yes. So uh, they could go on to YouTube and just plug in my name, Schellenberger. And I, I must have 20, 30 different videos on there that cover almost everything that you can cover. Uh, they can go on Amazon, plug my name in, and they'll see I've got four books out there. Most of them about ozone, but some of them touch on other areas. Uh, they can go to my website, which is antiagingmedicine.com. And on there, I've got a video page, and they can access other videos that talk about all kinds of things from thyroid to adrenal to, you know, cancer or whatever. Uh, and those, and also I have a newsletter. I should mention that. Uh, we've got uh, 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 some like 50,000 people that subscribe to this newsletter every month. Uh, and it's a fully referenced newsletter. Uh, so you people, if they want to, can go and look up the references and make sure I'm not just giving them a bunch of hogwash that I'm telling them the real deal. It's called Second Opinion. So people could go to Second Opinion Newsletter dot com and sign up for the newsletter but between all that there's a lot to be learned absolutely yeah there's some great resources um and if you guys enjoyed watching today's episode go ahead and like and subscribe to our youtube channel it's roscoe's wetsuit um, also you can listen to the audio version of the show on apple Podcasts, spotify iHeartRadio. radio um, so go check out either version also, follow us on Instagram. We are Roscoe's Wetsuit Podcast. Uh, Dr. Schallenberg, again, thanks so much for coming on today. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Have me back anytime. I enjoyed talking with you. Absolutely. Will do. Okay, take care. Take care.